Hi everyone, before we begin, I'd like to explain just why I wanted to make this video. I mean, pretty much every atheist on YouTube has already made at least one video debunking the Kalam cosmological argument. But they usually just look at the philosophy behind the argument, not the science, and that's what I wanted to do. See, the point of the argument is often to show that cutting-edge modern cosmology, really advanced science, indicates theism. And that's what William Lane Craig says. Contemporary cosmology would therefore seem to be an area of obvious concord between science and theism. But William Lane Craig is wrong about cosmology. Premise 1. Everything that begins to exist has a cause for its existence. Premise 2. The universe began to exist. Conclusion. Therefore, the universe has a cause for its existence. Because the universe is the entirety of physical reality, Hold on, I'll address that later. The cause of the universe must be outside physical reality. That is, it must be supernatural, and of course it must be able to create a universe. What do we call something supernatural that can create a universe? Well, I think the word God is perfectly applicable. Granted, we haven't established that this cause is a personal, intelligent being, but frankly, I don't care, because there are plenty of theists who think of their God as some sort of mystical force or something. So as far as I'm concerned, granting the conclusion implies granting at least some form of theism. Just to be thorough, let's go over some of the textbook refutations. Question begging. The universe is the set of everything except God, so God is the one thing that doesn't begin to exist. The argument is logically equivalent to the following. Premise 1. Everything except God has a cause. Premise 2. Everything except God is everything except God. Conclusion. Therefore, everything except God has a cause. Special pleading. In order to avoid an infinite regression of causes, the argument assumes without justification that God didn't begin to exist as well. Equivocation. The universe supposedly began to exist ex nihilo, out of literally nothing, but all things we know of that are caused to begin to exist are rearrangements of pre-existing stuff. The two premises use different meanings of the phrase begin to exist. Fallacy of composition. The universe is not a thing, but a set of things. Even if every thing that begins to exist must have a cause, this doesn't have to apply to the set of all such things. While these objections all work and completely destroy the argument, one thing they don't do is show just how badly you have to butcher physics in order to make the argument. For starters, what does it mean to begin to exist? I don't know, because in physics we don't use that kind of terminology. But let's see if we can work it out. Did I begin to exist? Well, yes, in the sense that I haven't always existed, duh. But every particle in my body existed before becoming part of me. I'm a configuration of pre-existing matter. The heavy elements in my body began to exist in stars where they were produced through fusion of lighter elements, ultimately hydrogen, that already existed. The building blocks of atoms are simply configurations of energy that already existed before becoming quarks or electrons. Even things like virtual particles that seemingly pop into existence spontaneously are configurations of energy that already existed. In every instance we know of where we can all agree that something begins to exist, we're actually talking about a system that already existed, transitioning from one state to another. The system does not contain x at a time t1, but it does contain x at t2. x has begun to exist. The system has transitioned from a state of not containing x to a state of containing x. The next problem is the word cause. In physics, the word cause is not a technical term. As such, it's hard to say what would count as a cause and what wouldn't. What we talk about in physics is the evolution of systems. Given these conditions at t1, we will find the system in this state at t2. When a physicist asks what caused something, he means how can we explain this? Gravitational interaction between the moon and the earth is what results in tides. Bill O'Reilly. So we can say, using sloppy and precise everyday language, that the moon's gravity causes tides. 
when a system transitions from one state to another, in this case high tide and low tide, this is due to the conditions present in the initial state that made the transition take place. This is a definition of cause that the Coulomb proponent should appreciate because it means that even quantum events are caused. Nuclear decay, for example, is often said to be uncaused, but it's actually the result of the conditions that are in place in the mother isotope. So yes, the daughter isotope is caused to begin to exist, even though there is a probabilistic element involved. In fact, every transition, not just ones where something begins to exist, would have a cause. Next, we need to establish what is meant by universe. As I've already mentioned, Kalam proponents use the word to mean not just our observable region of space-time, or even all of space-time, but all of physical reality itself, including any other universes, other space-times that is, that might exist in addition to ours. This is important because it means that to the Kalam proponent, the idea of time existing beyond the universe is an impossibility. Time is a physical quantity and it's therefore necessarily part of physical reality, which is synonymous with the universe, or so they say. The Kalam proponent must therefore believe that not only did the universe, as in space-time, begin, time must also have a beginning. Craig and other apologists like to bring up the bord guth vilenkin theorem, which supposedly proves that the universe, including time, must have a beginning. In 2003, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to show that any universe, which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion throughout its history, cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a beginning. Does it? Well, let's just read the paper something Craig apparently didn't do, or at least if he did, he didn't understand it. Our argument shows that null and time-like geodesics are, in general, past incomplete in inflationary models, whether or not energy conditions hold, provided only that the averaged expansion condition, h average greater than zero, holds along these past-directed geodesics. What does that mean? It means that any path through space-time, if followed into the past, will reach a boundary in the finite past. It does not follow that all such paths must converge into a singularity, only that they hit some kind of boundary. Now here's the kicker. What can lie beyond this boundary? Several possibilities have been discussed, one being that the boundary of the inflating region corresponds to the beginning of the universe in a quantum nucleation event. Note the emphasis I added. To continue, whatever the possibilities for the boundary, it is clear that unless the averaged expansion condition can somehow be avoided for all past-directed geodesics, Inflation alone is not sufficient to provide a complete description of the universe and some new physics is necessary in order to determine the correct conditions at the boundary. This is the chief result of our paper. Again, note the emphasis I added. The existence of a boundary does not have to imply a beginning of the universe. We don't know anything about the nature of this boundary. Plus, there are cosmological models where the expansion condition is avoided. For example, Sean Carroll has proposed a cosmological model where the universe has a time-reversed twin. Not to be confused with the evil twin mirror universe from Star Trek. Although that would be kind of funny. This model is both internally consistent and consistent with what cosmologists in general accept regarding the actual universe we find ourselves in. In that model, if we follow a geodesic in our universe into the past, it continues into the future of the twin universe on the other side of the Big Bang. However, since that universe expands backwards in time, this implies a negative average h value along that geodesic. In other words, the bord guth vilenkin theorem doesn't apply. While I certainly have my doubts about this model, the point is that no, we cannot categorically declare that time has a beginning. And if it doesn't, then Kalam falls flat on its ass, because the second premise is not just unfounded, it's downright false. The other possibility is, of course, that time does have a beginning. And for the record, based on my current knowledge of cosmology, this is what I believe. 
In this case, we actually have an even bigger problem because the terms begin to exist and cause, as we define them, are no longer applicable. When cosmologists talk about the beginning of the universe, what this refers to is the existence of a first moment of time. It's not a reference to a transition, because if time has a first moment, then by definition, the system of physical reality cannot have been in any state at all prior to that moment. Why? Because there was no prior moment. The idea of something preceding the beginning of time is simply nonsensical, just like a point north of the North Pole. Even if time has a first moment, time has always existed, because always in this context means throughout all time. In other words, if time began to exist, it must have begun to exist without being associated with any kind of transition. And that exposes another equivocation fallacy in the argument, in addition to the whole ex nihilo ex materia thing that I've already covered. Premise 1. All things with beginnings with transitions are caused. Premise 2. The universe has a beginning without a transition. Conclusion, the universe is caused. Either that or premise 1 refers to beginnings without transitions, but that would render the argument circular, because as far as we know, nothing but the universe could begin without a transition. I mean, if time doesn't exist, the idea of something other than time beginning to exist is nonsensical. If time does exist, then the beginning necessarily coincides with a system transitioning from one state to another. So we're left with premise 1. All things with beginnings without transitions, in other words, the universe, are caused. Premise 2. The universe has a beginning without a transition, which we already established. Conclusion. The universe is caused, which we already said. But have you noticed the biggest problem? If cause refers to the conditions present in the initial state, then because there was no transition at the beginning of time, there cannot be any such conditions. In other words, if the universe began to exist, then it necessarily did not begin due to conditions that were in effect before it began. Again, there were no conditions before it began, because there was no before it began. The universe must be uncaused. As far as I can see, the conclusion is inescapable. Even if God exists, he cannot have caused time to begin, because time cannot have been caused to begin. At least not in any way that makes any kind of scientific sense. Even if God exists, the universe has to be completely self-contained and preceded by nothing. Now, this doesn't mean that it was preceded by some mysterious state that Lawrence Krauss has decided to call nothing. It means it wasn't preceded. Period. This, of course, leads to the question of why there is a universe instead of nothing at all. And the answer appears to be that the laws of nature simply won't allow nothing to exist. Take away everything and you'll automatically get a universe. It's not that there was nothing, and then nothing spontaneously created something. The whole point of the models popularized by people like Lawrence Krauss and Stephen Hawking is that there can't be nothing. This is because of the impossibility of having exactly zero energy during a time interval of exactly zero seconds. Time and energy cannot both be exactly determined. If you have non-zero energy and a non-zero time interval, both space-time and energy will exist as the two are related through the field equations of general relativity. Since you can't have exactly zero of both, the existence of a universe is inevitable. If this is how the universe began, and let me stress that this is far from certain, we would expect the total energy of the universe to be either zero or very close to zero. This corresponds to a universe that is geometrically flat, at least at the scales we can observe. The flatness of the observable universe is confirmed by observations in the cosmic microwave background. For more information about this, I recommend that you have a look at what Lawrence Krauss is actually saying. If you read his book, for example, A Universe from Nothing, or listen to a talk that I'm linking to in the description. 
The point is that what we observe is perfectly consistent with the universe coming from nothing. That is, not coming from anything, but rather just beginning spontaneously. And while there are other possibilities, such as time being eternal, even though what we think of as our universe isn't, there is nothing, pun definitely intended, to even hint at the universe being conjured into existence by an invisible wizard. Hang on, I know. But nothing could apparently conjure a universe into existence, right? Well, yes. Again, this objection misses the point. Indeed, nothing can conjure a universe into existence. Universes aren't conjured into existence. There is no need to conjure them into existence. In the absence of a universe, a universe will begin spontaneously. So why don't we see universes beginning to exist all over the place? Well, because we're in one. There's a universe here. William Lane Craig, you rely on your audience being ignorant. You rely on your audience being completely uneducated when it comes to science or philosophy. And you appeal to science and philosophy to make your arguments. Are you dishonest or just really bad at your job as a philosopher? Or a combination of... yeah, that's probably it. Seriously, to someone who didn't get his education in the American Bible Belt, you sound like this. This here is the K. Lamb Cosmonaut argument. Which ain't from Russia, don't look the name for you. And it goes like this. Premise one. When some shit begins to exist from nothing, God must have done it, cause, cause, cause ain't no one else that could have done it. I mean, this is obvious. What are you, stupid? Premise three. The universe began to exist from nothing. Says so in the Bible. At least that's what my preacher says. But it don't matter, cause, cause I know y'all don't believe that, but, but, but you still believe the universe began from nothing. Just popped into existence one day, cause, cause it says so in the Big Bang that Darwin made up. Now, conclusion? God done it. Phrase like that, the stupidity of the argument is made clear. All you do, Craig, is dress it up in fancy language that disguises the stupid so that you have to think in order to spot it. You are in business for one reason only, Dr. Craig. Sheep don't think. See ya.